to um, the book of Acts and chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. And um, we carry on this evening looking at the, um, the, 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 the day of Pentecost in particular tonight. We are looking at the sermon that Peter preached on, on that day. Um, and last, last Lord's Day, we, we, we began to do that and um, look at how Peter explained to the, the watching crowd what the implication, the meaning of what they had seen was, um, what, what they had seen when the, 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 the group of believers that were gathered around um, were speaking in, in, in different languages, different tongues, um, and Peter be, be began to explain what it was that God was, was demonstrating by this and what this outpouring of the Spirit meant. And I, I said, uh, yeah, last, last um, Lord's Day, as far as the chapter is concerned, so chapter 2 begins with the, the detail of the phenomena that actually takes place so that these, these folks are speaking in um, languages they never learned. So they're speaking these new languages miraculously. Then it continues to, the, the, the largest part of this is the, the sermon, is, is Peter's sermon, which explains the, um, the, what they had seen and then invites them, persuades them, uh, evangelizes them, as it were, tells them to, to make a decision uh, based on what they had seen, to, that, that, that actually what they had just witnessed had implications for how they would go on to live their life from here on. Uh, and then ch chapter, the book closes with an account of, of all those who were touched and affected by the, the preaching of Peter uh, and, and came to become part of the church. But as far as this section, and so the major section I said, as I said last week, is actually a sermon. Most of chapter two is the sermon. Now, one thing, uh, one implication of that I suggested last week was that um, it, was, it was actually a, it, it, it was preparation um, for the, for what you would see in the rest of the book of Acts is a kind of signal um, a, a, a priority of place that is given to preaching in the first church, right? So you read the book of Acts, and Acts tells us what the church was like, the first church was like. And one thing you can say about the first church was that it saw preaching as vital to its, its mission, the way, it carried, the, the way it spread its message, central to how it spread its message, and central, actually, to the work of the Spirit among it was its preaching, but it wasn't just any kind of preaching. I mentioned a number of things that characterized first century preaching. Uh, and, and primary, perhaps, amongst all those things is the fact that first, the, the preaching of the first church was Christ-centered. It was about Jesus Christ. So it wasn't just any kind of preaching. It was that they preached Jesus. They preached about Jesus Christ. They preached about his ways. They preached about... Uh, the, 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 the ramifications of him being who they claimed him to be, who they testified him to be. So it was Christ-centered preaching. And, and so you have that modeled for us again in chapter 2, not just, as, not just the centrality of preaching. So you see that in the, um, the long, set, the long um, space that, yeah, that's given to, the amount of space, sorry, that's given to, pre to Peter's preaching in this chapter. But also, even in the preaching itself, there's a lopsided, if you want, bad emphasis, right? So much of the preaching, as we'll see tonight, is taken up with what Peter says about Jesus Christ. So last week, we looked at the first, we looked at what I said was maybe the first major division of the preaching. And that first major division of the preaching, uh, verses, from verse um, 14 to about 21, was Peter explaining this phenomena according to Old Testament scripture, yeah, according to, the, as, to be precise, the book of Joel, and explaining to these people that what they were witnessing was the outpouring of the Spirit which ushered in the 
the, um, the last days. Because the Spirit has been poured out, you're now witnessing the last days. You're witnessing the fulfillment of God's promises. The second section of that, of this sermon, however, basically says that the reason, however, for the outpouring of the Spirit. So yes, what you had just witnessed was the outpouring of the Spirit, which is the fulfillment of God's promises for the last days. But the reason for which the outpouring, the Spirit has been poured out, the, and so the source of the Spirit's outpouring, the point of the Spirit's outpouring is the fact that Jesus Christ has been exalted. So I, I said last week that you could summarize Peter's sermon in, in yeah, which it's still a mouthful of a summary, that Peter basically preached the sermon and said to this people that what they had witnessed, what they had just witnessed, was the fulfillment of God's promise to pour out his spirit upon his church in the last days that have now been ushered in by the exaltation of the crucified and resurrected Messiah and Lord. So they had witnessed the pouring out of the Spirit. God was fulfill, fulfilling his promises, but all this was happening. We're in the last days. All this is happening because Jesus Christ is exalted. Jesus Christ, the crucified, resurrected Messiah, is exalted. So the other half of um, Peter's sermon is concerned with that subject. It's concerned with Jesus, who is the basis for what you are seeing, he's is concerned with Jesus, who is the point of the church, right? The the reason for the church's existence. So the church is going to, sorry, the spirit is going to empower the church to do ministry. The spirit, and, and you're going to see that through the book of Acts, that the Holy Spirit is going to empower the church to to, to testify, to speak, to affect its community, and yet he's, he's going to add people to the church, as we we see towards the end of this chapter. And yet, the whole reason for that, the reason for it, the basis for it, is the fact that Jesus Christ is exalted. So, so, so uh, Peter's main point in this sermon is to speak to these folks who had witnessed the outpouring of the Spirit and who questioned what was taking place here. He's, his main point is to, is to say, Jesus Christ has been exalted. You need to recognize that Jesus Christ is now the king. He's king of, he, he's king of all. His name is above every other name. You need to recognize the kingship of Jesus Christ. And so the rest of this chapter is, is given to that. And, oh, sorry, the rest of, yeah, the, the, of Peter's sermon uh, deals with that. There's an interruption in the sermon later on, and Peter responds to that. But initially, uh, Peter then embodies and he presents the very message of the church. The message of the church is, is Jesus Christ, is to proclaim Jesus Christ. So in this early sermon of the church, we see um, one of the church's representatives modeling the, the kind of message that defined the church, the kind of message that defined the, that got to the heart of the church's purposes. And it was a message about Jesus Christ. It's a message um, about Jesus. And to look at that message this, 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 this evening, there are four significant stages I want to draw your attention to. So the apostle is concerned to talk about Jesus and Jesus' kingship. But he speaks about this kingship in, in four stages. Now, the final stage is him just declaring this Jesus is exalted. But you must not think that any of those stages, these stages um, are, are opposed to each other, or are at odds with each other. Actually, um, in one sense, these stages are, are, are all vital pieces, vital parts of this uh, kingship of Jesus Christ. Um, at every single one of these stages, even though it's in the final stage that you might say, um, Peter declares that Jesus is king, at every single one of these stages, you're witnessing the one who God has appointed to be king of the world, the one who God has appointed to be, um, to be, to have a name above every other name, the one who God has appointed to be worshipped. Uh, but, but Peter does address these four separate stages. The first stage, he points the 
um, the, the, the people to is the first stage of Christ, if you want um, kingship and exaltation, uh, is the, the stage of his life and ministry, the kind of life that Jesus Christ lived. So verse 22 says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So he gives, it's a brief description, but he does give a brief description about the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, he says, he tells us, he tells them he was a man, he was an actual human being. Christ lived in the world. They, they had seen him, they could have seen him. They must have heard about him. In fact, uh, Peter is so sure because he says, God attested to him, God, of, God, God almost bore witness to him by, making, by, by him doing, and there's an intensity of miraculous work here. Um, Peter says he did mighty works, right? Peter says he, he, um, he did wonders, he did signs. Um, and so his ministry wasn't hidden, it was public. They, they, they must have heard about him. Some of them had seen him. Some of them had felt his effects. Either way, Paul, sorry, Peter's point is that in the very life of Jesus Christ, they were able to witness the, his kingship. They were able to witness God's Messiah. Something about, about the life of Jesus Christ testified to the fact that he was the one th through whom God's spirit would be poured out. So, so, so here they were witnessing an outpouring of the spirit. Here, here they were uh, witnessing um, this, this, this miracle from heaven. And, 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 and Peter says, you can see, ultimately, this Jesus Christ is the one that poured out his, the, the Holy Spirit. But you can see the, that he was chosen for this. You, you can see that he's the one that pours out the Holy Spirit. You can see that he's God's king just from looking at the way he lived. Right? His life was a life that demonstrated that he had the Holy Spirit. Right? So what we're going to see in the final stage is that Jesus Christ pours out that Holy Spirit on the people. He pours out his Holy Spirit on the church. But in the day when he was living in the world, when he was in the world, he lived in such a way that showed that he had the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he has the Holy Spirit without measure. When he was on earth, you could tell that he wasn't just like any other man. You could tell that this was God's king. You, you, so, so Jesus Christ, although in one sense he wasn't finally crowned, in one sense we hadn't seen him, um, and in one sense we still haven't seen him in the fullness of his kingship, but even in the days of his flesh, even when he was living on earth, he was a king, he lived as a king. And one of the ways you see that is in the miraculous ways um, Peter tells us the miraculous ways, uh, his miraculous life and his miraculous ministry, right? Signs and wonders. Uh, and so Peter will draw our attention to the fact that this Jesus Christ changed water into wine. He will draw our attention to the fact that um, he, he gave sight to the blind. He will draw our attention to the fact that he walked on water. He will draw our attention to the fact that he stilled the storms. Uh, he will draw our attention to the fact that he fed thousands um, with two loaves of bread and two fish, uh, five loaves of bread and, and two fish, he will draw our attention to the fact that Jesus Christ raised the dead. He will draw our attention to the fact that his life was full of the miraculous. So, to deny this about Jesus, for example, to be ashamed to proclaim this, would be to undermine his kingship. In the, in the minds of the first church, you could not proclaim a Jesus who was less than a miracle worker. Right, right, right. That, 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 that's true even perhaps in a society that doesn't believe in miracles anymore. That, that's true in a society that thinks that science can answer everything. That, that's true in a, in, in a society that, that doesn't believe in the spiritual. That, that doubts that God intervenes in his world and demonstrates his power. 
Peter is very clear. We can't proclaim a Jesus who doesn't do miracles. It's why we have the Gospels and the Gospels uh, invariably without any hesitation, without any question, they, they, they tell us this Jesus, he, he's a miracle worker. He does wondrous things. That's what the Bible says about God himself. God does wondrous things. Well, here comes Jesus. He does wondrous things. And there's something about recognizing the kingship of Jesus that requires you to, to recognize the way he lived. He lived like no other. He lived like no other man. He, he wasn't just like any other man. Um, he, he did things that only God could do. There's something about that that feeds faith. There's something about that that prepares us to meet with him, to trust his kingship, to see the way he lived. Right? And we have to be very careful to that, careful there, because our, 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 our message is no better than the message of the first church. Right? We, we, we can't get any higher than the, church, than the message that the first church proclaimed. And they, they proclaimed a miracle-working Jesus. Right? And, and the church has to be careful to proclaim the same thing, to say that he, he, was, he worked miracles, unique miracles. He did signs and wonders, and, and to recognize that he, had, he has all power in his hands. And that is our Jesus. That's the Jesus we proclaim. No other Jesus can save, but, but one route you take to seeing. So, so, so the last thing that Peter says before he begins to talk about Jesus is, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what he says. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But one route to recognizing that this Jesus has the power to save is to, to pause and to think. Like Peter says in another sermon, everywhere he went, this Jesus went everywhere doing good. To, to realize my, my, my Jesus worked wonders to read of him in the Gospels and to see that the Jesus who I put my faith in now is the Jesus that did this, these great things, these wondrous things. So, so the first thing that Peter tells them uh, about the kingship of Jesus Christ is look at how he lived. Look at how he lived among you. This, this Jesus that I'm saying is the king now Think of how he lived. He lived like no other. The second thing he, second stage he points them to is his death. Right, second significant stage that Peter points them to is his death. Verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Later on in verse 36, He's going to say, God has made him both Lord and Christ, the Jesus whom you crucified. So from very early on, and Peter doesn't flesh out the significance in full perhaps, but from very early on, vital to the testimony of the church and to the kingship, the testimony of Christ's kingship was also his death. They proclaimed that Jesus was a king, but he was the crucified king. Of course, we'll see in a moment that he didn't stay in the grave, but he was crucified. It was important for the first church to testify, and what the Holy Spirit moved the first church to testify was that Jesus Christ died. They were to, they, they were to confess that. Now, as I said, Peter doesn't flesh out for us the significance of the death of Jesus Christ, perhaps as we see done in the rest of the book of Acts and in the rest of the, the New Testament. But there's no doubt that Peter has in mind that this death had special significance. Um, many people had died before Jesus Christ died. In fact, many people had been crucified before Jesus Christ died. But yet Peter wants to say, because he's the king of kings, because he's God's king, it's clear that no one died like he died. His death, his death was part of his kingship. 
So Peter says, as far as his death was concerned, yes, he was crucified by men, but in fact, perhaps if we pay attention to the order, he was firstly delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. He, his death was, was no accident. There, there was a perfect plan there. He, he died in a way that God had perfectly planned. He said it was according to the foreknowledge of God. Um, the apostle Peter says, sorry, Peter says a similar thing in his epistle when he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 18, that we were bought with the precious blood of Christ who was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last times for, the, for, uh, for, for your sake. Jesus Christ was crucified according to God's eternal plan. God planned it. Now, 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 he's going to say, historically speaking, Jesus Christ was also crucified by human beings. He was crucified by people. So the Bible is very clear about that. Jesus Christ was, was crucified in a fixed place at a fixed time. And we have to be careful to say that. It's a historical event. There's no denying that. Okay, um, I know sometimes we, 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 we speak, for example, of we, I'm the one that crucified him. Um, you know, behold, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. And as beautiful as that is, and as uh, helpful as even the metaphor is, we must not allow it to blur the fact that in one sense, Jesus Christ's death is such a historical fact and act that I wasn't among the scoffers calling out. I wasn't there. Didn't. Um, I didn't crucify him in a sense. I, I wasn't there. It was a fixed point in history. So Peter says he was killed by the hands of lawless men. Perhaps he's referring to the Roman soldiers. Perhaps he's referring to the, the Jews who's conspired to have him killed. Either way, these lawless men, uh, the, the, the innocent slain by the, by the guilty, uh, the pure slain by the, the vile. Uh, and so that's true. It's a, it's a, it's a historical act. It, it takes place in time. But Peter says, but everything that happened, even in history, was according to God's sovereign, def definitive plan. This is something that God prepared before the foundation of the world. Uh, the, 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 the death of Jesus Christ is even an exalted death. The death of Jesus Christ is part of how God testifies to his kingship. Because as it were, God prepared all of history for that point. Everything that's taken place so far, according to the foreknowledge of God, according to God's ability to not only see what's going to take place in the future, but to determine it. According to God's sovereign right to write the script of the world the way he so pleased. The way he so pleases. Right? According to what we know of an omniscient God, that means he knows the end from the beginning. You know, like God already knows if our nation is going to be crying tonight or rejoicing. He knows everything. He knows the score line. He knows who scored. He knows who missed. That's already done. Peter says, as incredible as it is to muse and ponder on God's perfect wisdom, this one truth you need to know. God's, even God's wisdom, God's perfect knowledge is so, is so prepared that the, the, the one truth he wants to draw you to, all of history that God has in his, in his spectacular mind, all of history that God has, has planned and prepared, all of it he's drawing you to the point of the death of Jesus Christ. This is what God has, this is how God has, 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 has prepared history for everything to, for everything to, 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 uh, to change, for, 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 for the death of Jesus Christ to be the touchstone of history, the touchstone of humanity, human existence, the death of Jesus Christ. Everything changes where he dies. 
That's why the prophet Joel speaks about, speaks in such almost convulsing terms when he speaks about the last days. Wonders in the heavens and above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. This thing shifts the very face of the earth because the son of God has died. He's the, he's the king that's dying. So, so, so the, the second stage that points to the kingship of Jesus. The point being, you can't testify to the kingship of Jesus. You can't really speak of Jesus as king. Peter can't speak of a king who is not crucified in the way that Jesus was, so that his death is a death like no other, a death that all of humanity must reckon with, right? It's, it's, it's a death, um, uh, and like, 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 every, like it's, a, it's a death that's a bloody death. Right? But, but you either wash yourself, your, your sins are either washed away in the blood that spills from that cross or you reject it and you face God's judgment. But his death, his death is his second stage, which is a stage of, his, exal, of his, his exaltation. And it's crucial to say that because, again, these next two stages we often are, we, we, we typically assign to the exaltation of Christ. or so we think of Jesus Christ of king, as king and we think of these other two stages but those first two stages are also very crucial for telling us what it means that Jesus Christ is king. But the third stage, and the stage that Peter spends the most time on, is, is, is the resurrection. Right? So from verse 24 to 32, Peter enters into testifying about the resurrection. In fact, he, he's going to say in the last verse that deals with the resurrection, verse 32, that we are witnesses to him. You know, it's almost like we, we, we've been called, we, we can be called to court to testify about this because we, we've seen it. We stand here to testify to what we've seen. So the, the third stage that, uh, that Peter points to is the, is, is the resurrection. We, have, we, have, we, we saw him uh, raised up from the grave. We, 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 we realize, you can realize that he is God's king you, you can realize that uh, he's the one, he, he's the only one through whom um, God reigns. He's the only one through whom you can know God when you look at how God raised him from the grave. God raised him from the grave to testify that this Jesus was his king. That's what, um, that's what, that's what Peter says in verse 24. God raised him up. God raised him up. Um, this, this was God's, God's affirming of him, God's placing his seal upon, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. God raised him up. And, and Peter enters into a variety of imagery here. I mean, primarily he's going to contrast Jesus Christ with, with David, preparing us for his final statement that Jesus Christ is the king because David was associated in... in um, in much of the scriptures, and with the Jews, David is associated with the, um, with the scepter. He's, he's associated with, 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 with kingdoms and kingship. And here Jesus Christ is going to show us, sorry, peace is going to show us Jesus Christ is a greater king than David. Uh, but, but before that, he tells us in verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death. Again, you, you don't have a fully developed doctrine of the resurrection here, but you have hints of the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ was freed from the agonies of death. You can only imagine that this was preparation for the sort of preaching that would comfort believers in the time to come. Because your Savior was, your Savior was loosed from the pangs of death, the, the birth pangs, the agony of death, the horror of death so you can be loose from the horrors of death. God raised him up. And God loosed him from the horror of death because it was impossible for him to be held by. It was not possible for him to be held by it. Uh, death can only lay claim to um, those who, because of sin, belong to it. Uh, death only has a legal right over those who, because of their sin, have been cursed to face it. But this Jesus, because he was pure and innocent and holy and undefiled, the very Son of God, 
uh, death couldn't hold him. He, he defeated death. He destroyed death. It was not possible for him to be held by death. And, and to demonstrate this, P Peter draws our attention to um, the Psalms and, and Psalm 16 in particular. And he quotes this Psalm and he says, in the Psalm, in Psalm 16, David, this is a psalm where, where David is, 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 is confessing that God will deliver him, is confessing his faith in God's ability to deliver him. And David says in verse, David says in that psalm, uh, in verse 27, Peter quotes him, you will not abandon my soul to Hades, the, uh, the, the, the grave. The, the place of the departed souls, or let your Holy One see corruption. You will not let my body decay. My body won't decay. That's what happens when you die. You, you know, you, folks who die are buried, and their body decays, and, you know, and decomposes, and so on. And, 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 and Peter says, David can't be speaking about himself, right? Because we, we know where David's tomb is. We, people take People, people go sightseeing and say, that's, that's David's tomb. Um, people can excavate David's tomb and, and so on. His, his body's there. You, it's not the same with Jesus. It's not the same with Jesus Christ. God raised him up. God raised him up. He's, he's, he, he was, he's the one. He's the only one whose body never saw corruption. He, he's, the, he's the only one who escaped the clutches of death and the grave. Uh, and, and so Peter even carries on and quotes the psalm, verse 20, 28, you have made known to me the paths of life. Uh, Jesus Christ is the only one who has life in and of himself. Uh, we, all have, we all have in our own selves, we have a life that will give way to death. Jesus Christ has defeated death and now he lives never to die again. Uh, and he, he, Peter explains that in the rest of, uh, from verse 29 onwards, he says, um, this David was buried, and, and, and what he was doing, he was, he was testifying to, he, he was speaking prophetically in the Psalms. The Psalms are a prophecy that one day God will raise up a king who would be able to say the words that David could not say. One day David, God would raise up a king who would be able to say, you did not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. And Peter says that Jesus Christ is that king because his tomb is empty. Uh, to think about the kingship of Jesus Christ, we must, we must think about how man's greatest enemy is death. You know, it's fine for someone to say like, See, the Romans in the time of the first church would have said that they don't want Jesus as their king. In fact, it's, it's thought that um, when, when the first century believers referred to Jesus as Lord, one of the things they were doing was testifying that it wasn't Augustus that was their Lord. It wasn't Caesar that was their Lord. It was, it was Jesus. He's my king. It's fine for you to say, I don't want Jesus to be my king. Um, I, I, I prefer this other person or this other king. But, but what Peter says to us tonight is, there's only one king who can defeat death. What king will you choose? What, what king are you? Who, who do you want to really be a king? Who, who do you want to rule over you? Who do you look at? What is it that you're looking at? You say, that's my king. And Peter says, None of them can deliver from death. Doesn't matter how renowned they are, how brilliant they are, how scientific they are, how philosophical they are, how rich they are, how strong they are, how fast they are. They cannot defeat the grave. They can't defeat death. And so Peter proclaims his own king, God's king, and he's God's king because he rose again. He's God's king, and so he was able to defeat death. The third stage of um, Jesus Christ's kingship is this resurrection. He rose from the grave. The fourth stage, then, is 
you might call it the very exaltation. And it, it's, it's, it's important to recognize that when, for example, uh, Peter is going to say that Jesus Christ has been exalted, verse 33, he was exalted to the right hand of God. Um, Peter is not denying that Jesus Christ was a king before, um, before, before this point. He's not denying that Jesus Christ was, was God's king even before he died and before he rose again. But this is the final stage, if you want, of that kingship. This is um, that kingship magnified for all to see. And so the first, in this first sermon of Peter, in this first, first sermon in the first church, Peter tells them Jesus Christ is exalted. He, he's the king. He, he's king. He reigns. He, he reigns. He, he reigns and he, he's king. And so he's at the right hand of God. Verse 33. He's at the right hand of God. Uh, the right hand in, um, in Jewish thought is, is, is the hand of favor. So to say something's at my right hand is to say it's at the, uh, the, the, the hand of favor, the preferred side. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God. These sort of thoughts um, moved the first church to say, there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. All of God's favor he is giving to Jesus. If, if we want to have any joy in, in God, we, we find it through Jesus Christ. If you want to know what God is like, Jesus Christ is at his right hand. If you want to speak to God, it's through Jesus. Jesus is at his right hand. That's his right hand. God doesn't do anything. He, he, doesn't, he, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't act in anything that doesn't exalt his son. His son is at the right hand. Is at the hand where you give all that you have, all your inheritance. You give everything to him. Jesus is at the right hand of God. He's exalted. Um, all the power, and you'll see this in a moment in, in, in how the first church referred to Jesus in the end. All the power that God has, he has given to this Jesus. Everything he has is in Jesus Christ. He's at the right hand of the Father. Furthermore, now that he's exalted... He received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit and poured, it, poured him out upon us. Right now that he's exalted, he, he's the one who gives, he gives the Holy Spirit. He pours out the Holy Spirit. It's him, it's, it's through Jesus that we receive the Holy Spirit. Because he's king, it's through him that we receive that vital spiritual life. Because he's king, um, it's, it's, it's in his name that our souls are nourished because he's king. Uh, if, if, we, if, we're, if we're seeking to have rest in God, if we're seeking to walk with God, to hear from God, it's Jesus alone who pours out the Holy Spirit. The key, the key to, to know uh, the life of God in you is to look to Jesus. He, he's the one who pours out the Holy Spirit. If we need the Holy Spirit for to do everything, if we need the Holy Spirit to do for any kind of spiritual vitality, and we do, the way to get it is to, to call upon Jesus. The, the only way to get it is to have Jesus as your, as your king. And those who have Jesus as their king have an endless reserve of the Spirit's strength. Jesus Christ pours out his Spirit upon his people and lavishly as well. Uh, and, and then Peter says in, in, in that 36th verse, let all the house of Israel therefore know that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This Jesus Christ, Peter says, he's Christ, he's, he's the Christ, he's the Messiah. He's the one um, that the Old Testament scriptures prophesied about. He's God's chosen man. God's chosen man to bring salvation. He's, 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 he's the Messiah. He's the, he's the deliverer that was promised. He's the rescuer. He's the real Messiah. He's the Messiah. But he also calls him Lord. 
And when he calls Jesus Christ Lord, he's not simply saying that Jesus Christ is the master of everything. He's saying that Jesus is master. But actually, what Peter is really doing, he's applying, if you want, the highest name of God in the Old Testament. He's applying that to Jesus Christ. Um, he's apply, applying what we, we often translate as, as, the Yahweh, as Yahweh, which would have been thought as the personal name of God. He, he, he's applying that to Jesus Christ. He's saying this Jesus, he has the, the highest name. His name is above every other name. He, he's saying to them, Jesus Christ is so high, there's no worship that you cannot afford him. There's no worship you cannot give him. He, he's that high. He, he's that high. There's, there's no worship that you think belongs to God that does not belong to him. He's, he's high and exalted. Those are the four stages then of this kingship of Jesus that, um, that Peter proclaims to, um, to, to the first church. He, he proclaims that Jesus Christ was a king in his life and ministry. He proclaims that Jesus was a king in his death. He proclaims that Jesus was king in his, in his resurrection. And he proclaims that Jesus Christ is king in his exaltation to the right hand of the Father. Let me close by making these applications. First of all, just to juxt the, 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 the juxtaposition, if you want, of Acts chapter 2. So the, the way um, the, 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 the account of Pentecost and, the, and, and Peter's first part of the sermon where he speaks about um, the promised outpouring of the Spirit in the book of Joel, just the way that is positioned beside Peter's sermon on Jesus Christ might be indicative of something, that when the Spirit is present upon a people, they speak about Jesus Christ, they magnify him. That when people are full of the Spirit, and the book of Acts speaks very often about being filled with the Holy Spirit. When people are filled with the Holy Spirit, the mark of it is that they, 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 they grow in the knowledge of Jesus. They grow in their ability to be in awe of him and everything that he does, to love every part of him, to love everything that he says, to love everything that he is. And so, so far in the sermon, Peter hasn't even really been primarily evangelistic, right? He hasn't necessarily even offered, he will do, and we'll come to see that next time. He hasn't even made a gospel offer. The bulk of his sermon is him just speaking about how great Jesus Christ is just for who he is. He hasn't even begun to really wrestle with how Jesus helps us or how Jesus changes us or how Jesus comforts us or how Jesus is with us um, as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death or, or how Jesus will save us. He hasn't even begun to deal with that. He, he, Peter is just basking in, in the wonder of who Jesus is and what he does. When, when the Spirit is poured out upon us, there is, there is an increasing, there is an incre- increasing death to attention with self, to an obsession with who Jesus is. We're, we're really intrigued by Him. We're caught up by Him. We are. We really want to learn more about Him. We're really amazed by Him. That's what the Spirit does to us. He, and He makes us want to speak about Him. These are the mighty works of God. You're speaking about Jesus. On the flip side, um, very often, unfortunately, people have thought that to, um, to testify to Jesus Christ, oh, sorry, that the, the Spirit's work of testifying in, in the church is, is to be seen in signs and wonders. But, but, but look how quickly Peter shifts from attention on the phenomena that actually took place on the day of Pentecost to just talking about Jesus. What, what's the priority of Acts chapter 2? To break down how the, fire of tongues hap- the tongues of fire happen, to break down how the rushing wind happens, far from the case. The priority of Acts chapter 2 is to tell us about Jesus and what he has done and what he's accomplished and who he is. And for us to be intrigued by that, for us to be amazed by him, for, for, for us to feel like that's, um, that's, uh, that, that's worth a lifetime of, 
fascination and dedication. That's what the Spirit does for us. That might be the mark that we are really filled with the Holy Spirit, is that we are, all of us, all of our being is caught up with Jesus Christ. If I can, if I, if I give you an easy, an easy example tonight, I, I know that so many of you, you can feel the tension in the nation tonight. You are, you're just, you're, you, 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 you know the buzz, you know the excitement. You know the, well, you might, even if you're not a football fan tonight, you, you're going to feel the whole, or the, the, the entire spectrum of, of, of feelings that folks go through, uh, the, 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 the excitement, the disappointment, the sorrow. The, and by the time we've, you've gone through that, if you watch that match tonight, we, we need to ask ourselves the extent to which we've known such affection for Jesus. How much, how, do, have we known what it is to truly be excited about Jesus Christ, to be fascinated by him, to be, um, to, 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 to have tension because we want to know more of him, to feel sorrow because we don't know enough of him. Um, do we know that that range of emotion for Jesus, right, it, it, it's literally a helpful example because we often feel like when it comes to spiritual things, we can divorce our natural range of emotion. So don't, don't, don't think that, the fact I'm so passionate about football, don't, don't use it to judge my passion for Jesus Christ. It's not true. Um, when the Spirit has filled our hearts, all that we are is consumed by Him. He, he becomes the most beautiful thing to, to behold. Our prayer has to be, as we cry out for the Holy Spirit, um, to fill me with a love for this Jesus, who he is and what he has done. And the last thing just to say is, and even though we haven't arrived there, Peter doesn't just give this information for information's sake. He's not interested in lecturing these people. There's intention behind the information he puts out. Peter tells them about Jesus because Peter believes that every man and woman has to make a, a decision about what they do with him. If this Jesus did all these miracles, if this Jesus died and then rose again, if he's king, then you have to decide what you believe about him. What will you do with him? Right? You can say, like, there was a group of folks who said, you people are just drunk. You, you can say, this is all fanciful stuff. Like, who believes this? Like, how can you believe this about someone? You can say that. You can say that, uh, or you can r recognize that actually Jesus Christ calls you to deal with things that really matter. Uh, you, you can actually be humble and ask yourself what the message of Jesus is and realize that the message of Jesus Christ is a testimony that all of us have sinned and come what may, we have to face the judgment of God and say to yourself, how true is that? I don't want to spoil your match tonight. But no matter what happens in that game, no matter how you respond when you watch the game, that's such a small, fleeting part of your life. It's not true that the result of that game would truly change our lives. That's not true. You tell that to someone who's faced, who's faced death. You, you tell that to us when we're at the point of death and you see what really matters. Doesn't matter how much you pour into these, these, these trivial things. They're passing away. What really matters is when, what we are when we stand before God. Um, <laughs> liars and thieves and fornicators and murderers will watch this game today. It's not going to make any difference. Um, it's when we stand before the face of God that we come to see I'm, I'm guilty, I'm in need of mercy. What's going to happen when we stand before God on the day of judgment? We all have to face death. What will happen then? And this is where you see that Jesus matters. When you hear his gospel, his message, that actually Jesus Christ can save you from your sin. He can save you from yourself. He can make you right with God. Jesus Christ can prepare you for eternity. He can prepare you to deal with the question of death because death could not hold him. He loosed the pangs of death. You have to decide what you will do with Jesus Christ. 
But just know that to reject him is to deny the reality of eternity. To reject him is to deny that your conscience tells you that you have sinned against God. Is to deny the knowledge that you have of what is right and what is wrong. It's to deny that, that we've all fallen short of God's glory. We've all sinned, we've all messed up, we've all done wrong things, and we need a savior. Uh, and if we can face that reality tonight, uh, then you know that we ought to run to Jesus Christ, the King, the exalted King, and you can trust him and say, I saw how he lived. He died and rose again that I might live with him uh, forever. And, and so uh, Jesus Christ is preached to men and women uh, so that they might come and put their trust in him and say, Jesus Christ is not just a king. He is a king, but, I, but, but Jesus is now my king. Amen.